All right, so hi everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron Lacuse, and I'm a postdoc uh, here in the research group that runs Skynet and uh, Prof. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about all of them. Uh, so uh, in this course, you know, it's an observational astronomy course, and one of our main tools in observational astronomy are telescopes. So uh, why do we use telescopes? Why don't we just go out and stare at the night sky with our eyes? What do telescopes do? There's two basic functions that they do. What are those? Magnify. They magnify. So the first thing that telescopes do is they magnify. They make objects look bigger. Okay, so even really small things on the sky, we can make them look bigger. We can get some detail on them. What else do telescopes do? They make objects bigger. What else do they do to objects? They make objects brighter. Absolutely. So telescopes. Basically, will make things bigger, they'll make things brighter. So they're going to be better than your eye for doing those sorts of things. Now, making objects bigger, that's pretty easy to think about, right? We're just going to take something, we're going to zoom in on it. It's just like using a pair of binoculars. You just are able to make the image look bigger. Making things brighter is a little bit weirder to think about, actually. So uh, if you were to stare at a 100 watt light bulb for an hour, does it get any brighter? Has anyone actually tried staring at a 100 watt light bulb for an hour? I don't really recommend it. It's a pretty boring way to spend an hour, but the light bulb doesn't really get any brighter. And why doesn't it get any brighter? Well, you have to think about how your eye works. Um, you'd like to think of it as being kind of like a light bucket, that you're just collecting light that comes in. But the problem is the way your eye detects light, it's a chemical process. So your eye is essentially constantly refreshing itself. So it's not going to gain more and more light the longer you stare. It's eventually going to start flushing itself and you won't see it. So it works kind of like a bucket with a hole in the bottom. So it'll collect some light, but it also has light constantly draining out, essentially, if you get it that way. So no matter how long we stare at an object with our eye, it's not going to get brighter. But if we have a telescope, and more specifically, if we have a camera on our telescope, a CCD camera, that camera is going to keep getting light for the entire time that we have the shutter open, right? So now we have a light bucket, but our bucket does not have a hole in the bottom anymore. This is good. It means that we can stare at a faint object for a long time and bring out a whole bunch of detail. Now this light bucket <coughs> analogy also works really well with telescopes here, because you can think of the size of your telescope as the size of your bucket. So if you think of it this way, let's say I wanted to collect rainwater, and I could go outside and if I had like a a plastic solo cup, I could stick that out there, but I'm going to have to wait a long time for that solo cup to fill up with water. Or I could go get one of those like big plastic child's waiting pools, and I could stick that out there for a much shorter period of time and get the same amount of water, right? Because I've got a much bigger area that the water is falling into. Same idea with telescopes. The bigger my telescope is, the bigger my light bucket is. So I'm able to see fainter things faster by having a larger telescope. Okay? All right. So. Uh, we could, even with all of that in mind, the telescopes will make things bigger and telescopes will, will make things brighter, well, we could take our telescopes and then just look through them with our eyes. Now, there are some problems with doing that, what's called eyepiece observing. We don't really do much eyepiece observing in this, this course, so hopefully none of you signed up for the course thinking you were going to stare through a telescope all semester. Not really going to happen. So, why don't we do eyepiece observing? What's, what's bad about eyepiece observing? What are some downsides to this? Let me ask this, what's the weather like today? It's cloudy. Okay, so if the weather's cloudy, how's that going to work for eyepiece observing? If you have to physically be on the telescope staring through it, how well is that going to work for you? Not very well at all, right? You can't really stare through the clouds. So uh, cloudy nights are going to be a problem. So since we can't manipulate the weather around here, uh, that's going to be an issue for us. There's also only a few objects that your eye could actually see. Remember, your eye is constantly refreshing its, itself, right? It's the, the, the bucket with the hole in the bottom. So even if we're staring through an eyepiece, we're still not going to be able to see the faintest things. There's only a small amount of things in the sky that your eye could actually see. And compounding the problem, here in Chapel Hill, has anyone gone out on a dark night here in Chapel Hill and looked at the night sky? <clears throat> can't see anything. There aren't that many stars that are out, right? You can't really see them. Why can't we see those stars? What's the problem here in Light pollution. Light pollution, the number one problem in astronomy. There's city lights, there's street lights, light from houses. There's lights all over the place. And all of that light drowns out the faint light of the stars. So light pollution is a problem. So there are only a few things that we could see, even if we tried to go out there with the telescope. We also have this kind of limited observing time, right? So when's your lab? It's on 
what is it, Wednesday from 2 to 4, or 4 to 6, I'm sorry, it's Wednesday from 4 to 6. Is it nighttime? <coughs> Can we see any stars? No. Well, we're out of luck, that's the end of the semester, we're not going to see any of you guys. No, really. So we have this limited window when we can observe if we actually want you guys to actually stare through a telescope. We could reschedule the lab, you know, between 3 and 5 in the morning. Is that okay? No. No? That's not going not to work for you guys? No. Okay, so I guess we're going to have to scratch out these observing, so that's not good. Uh, it's also hard to do any kind of real analysis, right? I mean, we could ask you kind of uh, qualitative questions. Could you measure anything quantitatively if you were just staring through the eyepiece? You'd say, well, this star's kind of bright, and this star's maybe a little bit red. Maybe we could make you stare at the moon and you could draw a sketch. Can you really measure anything accurately from any of those? Not really. So quantitative analysis is not really going to work well with eyepiece observing. So why don't we just go ahead and skip all of the eyepiece observing, and we'll actually do observations with cameras on telescopes and not in Chapel Hill. That's probably going to work out less for us. So a uh, quick geographic quiz. You guys thought the quiz was over? Nope. The quiz is not over. we got one more question. Quick geographic quiz. Chile, which is where the prop telescopes are located, is located directly south of which U.S. state? And I'm even going to narrow it down for you. I'll give you four choices. You don't have 50 to pick from, just four. So by show of hands, how many people think that Chile is directly south of California? <coughs> and how many people think Maine? A few hands for Maine. How about Georgia? At least one hand for Georgia. How about Texas? A few hands for Texas. A couple of you didn't vote. <laughs> It's not really good. We should all participate. Well, for those of you who said Maine, congratulations, you are correct. So most people in their minds take South America and shove it much further over to the west. <coughs> it's not. South America sticks quite far out into the ocean. So Chile is essentially directly south of Maine. Now, why did I ask that question? This actually has some ramifications for what we do in this lab. So let me ask this question. Now that we know roughly where Chile is, in relation to the U.S., if it's nighttime in North Carolina, what time of day is it in Chile? You've got two choices, nighttime, daytime. <laughs> okay, I had at least some daytimes, I had a few nighttimes. It's nighttime. Okay, if it's nighttime here, it's nighttime there. Because remember, there's that terminator, you know, the line between night and day, it's going across the globe, and it's moving around the globe, but it's moving around the whole globe. You know, a lot of people tend to think, okay, if it's nighttime here, it must be daytime there. No, the seasons are backwards. The time of day is not backwards. So when it's winter time up here, it's summertime down here, but as far as daytime, nighttime goes, they're essentially on the same time as we are, okay? So the reason that's important is if I had you putting observations right now to be taken in Chile, would your observations come back right now? No, they've got to wait for sunset in South America before we're actually going to be able to get those observations, okay? So keep that in mind when you're putting your observations in. Now, you don't really need to worry about that. You can go ahead and put your observations in now, and that's fine. The system will take them tonight, but you won't get them back right now, okay? You can put them in ahead of time. The system will take them when it gets around to it, but just know that if you, you get up, you know, 8 in the morning, and you put your observations in, and then 5 at night, you're trying to find your observations, yeah, they haven't actually happened yet, right? Because we're still waiting for sunset to happen in Chile. Okay? All right, so what does our site actually look like? Well, here's an overhead view, uh, an aerial view of the site down in Chile. Uh, our telescopes are located in a place called Saratololo Inter-American Observatory, CTIO for short. Uh, there are a whole bunch of telescopes there. Not all of these telescopes are ours, but the ones that actually belong to us are this little cluster of six telescopes right down here, these six domes. And this little red X here is where we're building a seventh telescope. You'll actually be able to see the building from that uh, a little bit later on tonight when we go to one of the other demos. Uh, and this other back here is where we're going to build an eighth telescope. Uh, it's not yet built at all, so you won't see that one at all. But we're going to be using those six. But there are a bunch of other telescopes here on the mountain. So, uh, looking at this image, can you think of any reasons why we put our telescopes here? Other than peer pressure, because everybody else built their telescopes here. Are there any, is there anything about this image that leads you to believe that this is a good site to have telescopes? What? Not a lot of light pollution. Can you see any cities or towns in the background there? No, it's deserted. There's nothing around. So light pollution, light pollution is not an issue here. I mean, the people on the mountain who built these telescopes, we're not going to put lights all over our buildings, right? That would be <coughs> counterproductive, so we don't do that. So anything else in this image? That, uh, yes? High elevation. High elevation. We're on top of a mountain here, right? Why do we want to put our telescopes on top of a mountain? Why is that good? Uh, 
less cloud coverage. Weather, it can change the weather. So if we're high enough, this is how they get away with it in Mauna Kea, right? So out in Hawaii, does it rain in Hawaii? Yes, it rains in Hawaii all the time. So why do we build telescopes in Hawaii? Well, the answer is we built them on top of a really tall mountain in Hawaii. So all the weather happens below it. And in fact, that's true here. Most of the weather happens down in the valleys. We don't really get a lot of cloud cover that comes up to the top of the mountain here. Why else might we want it high up other than weather? The air, right? What's the biggest problem that we have observing from the ground? It's things going on in the atmosphere. Have you ever looked at the night sky and seen a star and it's kind of twinkling? Do you know why that star is twinkling? I'm sorry? The wind. The wind? Uh, kind of. It's, it's related to that. It's essentially turbulence in the atmosphere between you and that star. So all the air between you and that star is moving around in some fashion. It's making the star kind of twinkle a little bit. It's moving the light around the star. Well, the higher up we go, the less air we have to look through. I mean, ideally, we take our telescopes and we put them in orbit. Then we're not looking through any air. But that is extremely expensive, so we couldn't pull that off. So the next best thing, go to the top of the mountain. So anything else about this image that strikes you? Anything at all? Are there any trees in this image? Why aren't there any trees in this image? Too high up. It's part of it. You can see the horizons. Trees would be a problem with horizons, but we do have chainsaws, so we had to. We could just clear cut the top of the mountain. That's not what we've done here. Um, what kind of vegetation do you see on top of this mountain? It's really, really dry. We're actually in the middle of a desert. We're not only on top of a mountain, we're on top of a mountain in the middle of a desert. Why would you want to be in the middle of a desert? It goes back to cloud cover, right? Do deserts get a lot of rain? No, absolutely not. They have a crazy number of clear nights per year here at this site. Something like 300 clear nights per year at CTIO. I mean, think about that a minute. Think if we had 300 clear days here in Chapel Hill, think how crazy that would be. Uh, but yeah, so uh, weather's an issue. Uh, we want to be at a high altitude. There's no light pollution. So this is really a great site to put our telescopes. So here they are a little bit close up. Uh, so here are our prompt telescopes. This one here in the front, this is not prompt 7. This is just a small telescope we happen to have out there when we took this picture. Uh, but prompt 7 is actually going to sit right about where that one is. Uh, so at the beginning of the night, our telescopes do a really interesting thing. They do an imitation of Pac-Man and on it. So, uh, they open up just like that. So our telescopes open all the way up, and now you can see uh, inside the domes there, those are all our little telescopes. Um, there's a specific name for this kind of dome. Anybody know what this kind of dome is called? It's named after an animal that lives in the ocean. You might eat it. I'm not fond of them myself, but some people are. Close. Very, very close. Clam. A clam. They're called a clamshell dome. Okay, so the two halves open up just like a clamshell does. So when we open up, we're completely exposed to the air. Anyone know why we did this? Well, let's ask this. Is there another kind of dome you've ever seen that isn't a clamshell? I'll give you a hint. It's directly above you. There's a dome on top of this building, right? The observatory on top of this building. Is that a clamshell dome? No. What, what does that dome look like? How does it open up? There's a slit, and in fact, that's what this kind of a dome is called. It's called a slit dome. So instead of opening all the way up, there's just a slit with two panels that open up, and then the slit rotates around and we can look out of it with our telescope. So why might we have gone with a clamshell rather than a slit kind of dome? Anyone know? Any downsides to a clamshell you can think of offhand? Yes? Rain would be a problem, but hopefully we don't have any of our domes open when it's raining even whether it's a slit or a clamshell, but it is a little bit worse if we have a clamshell, right? Uh, but you're kind of on the right track. There's something else that goes on in the air that might be important when our dome is open. Wind, absolutely, wind. So if it's windy and we have our telescope completely exposed, what happens when wind blows against the telescope? I'm sorry? It's, it's gonna shake it, right? It's gonna shake the telescope around. So in fact, we knew that, so we went ahead and made our telescopes. You can see they don't really have a tube on them. They're completely open. That's so the wind can just blow right through the telescope. So it doesn't act as a sail. So it doesn't vibrate around a lot. Now we can get away with that. Normally telescopes have the big tubes on the outside to keep stray light out. But remember, I don't really have any extra light here. There's no light pollution here. 
So I don't really have to worry about that too much. Building a telescope here in Chapel Hill, you definitely want that jacket on the outside. And you'll see when we go upstairs that the telescope upstairs does have a jacket on the outside. Uh, so there you go, that's our site. Uh, there's another reason why we went with the clamshell design. The real reasoning behind it is the thing we wanted to study with these telescopes, why they were built in the first place. We study gamma ray bursts, and these are the death of a supermassive star. But we have no idea when they're going to happen, we have no idea where they're going to happen, but when they do, we need to look at them as quickly as possible. So if my telescope is pointed over on that side of the sky, and a gamma ray burst goes off over on that side of the sky, I can just flip my telescope around as fast as it can go and start taking data. If I had a slit dome, my slit would be pointed over there. Not only does my telescope have to fl flip around, but I now have to rotate the entire dome all the way around before I can start taking data. And the telescope can move faster than the dome can. So we decided just to skip the slit dome altogether and went with the clamshell domes. Okay? All right, so even though it is a desert, there is some wildlife. So here's a Chilean condor. It's the one on the left. Uh, the one on the right is Kevin. He's one of our programmers. Uh, he wrote quite a bit of the software that you guys will be using behind the scenes. Uh, but these guys are really cool. We see them around the observatory all the time down there. Um, every now and then they like to stand on top of our domes, but that's usually during the day. They don't fly around at night. But they ride all the thermal currents that are coming up the valley as the valley gets warm during the day. Uh, but they're pretty cool. Uh, there are also Chilean foxes. He's a little bit hidden, but he's right here. He blends in quite well. He's colored very nicely for living on the mountain. Uh, the Chilean foxes are uh, kind of cool. They hang out. Uh, the cooks like them. The cooks sit on the mountain, the cafeteria. They feed them scraps and things, so they're fairly tame. Uh, anyone own a cat? Anyone have a pet cat? Have you ever seen your cat yawn? It's kind of disturbing because their mouth opens so far. They've got nothing on these foxes. Man, those guys, they open like 180 degrees. It's crazy when they yawn. But anyway, uh, they're pretty cool, so the Chilean foxes there. Um, this is not quite Chilean wildlife, uh, but this is Dr. Dan Reichert. Um, he's the man in charge. He's the guy who's responsible for building this whole system and for making the course that you guys are taking. Uh, but he's a pretty cool guy. You'll see him around campus from time to time. Um, so let's talk about the telescopes in a little bit more detail. So here is one of our front telescopes. Uh, and I'm going to point out most of the major parts of it. So we refer to these telescopes as being robotic telescopes. It doesn't mean that a robot actually controls them, but each of the pieces can talk to a computer so that you don't need a human being there at the time. So we have the mount, which is this big red thing down here, and that's how it knows where to point on the sky. Uh, we have the telescope itself, which is this big open truss thing. Um, it isn't that much different from the telescope upstairs in any way, except that we took the jacket off. Right? We took the tube off the outside. Uh, but we have a 16-inch primary mirror down in the bottom, and the light bounces off into the primary and then bounces off into the secondary mirror before it goes back through a hole in the primary, the primary shaped like a donut. And so we have our instrumentation on the back. And on the back, the instruments that we have are a filter wheel, and we have a camera. Now, why do we have a filter wheel on there? There's something weird about our cameras. You know what that is? What's odd about our cameras compared to, say, your camera you know, that you've got here? Black and white images. They take black and white images, right? Our cameras are black and white cameras. So if we want any color information, we have to pick a filter to put in front of it. So if I put a red filter in front of it and I take an image, what color is my image? Red. What color is the image itself? It's still black and white. It's still the black and white picture, right? So when you pull it up on Skynet, it's not going to look red. It's not going to look blue if you use a blue filter. It's still going to look gray. It's going to look black and white to you. But it's a black and white image of the color light that you wanted to look at. So there's a flag that's set in the header of the image so that it knows this black and white image is actually the red light. If you took another one that's the blue light and another one that's the green light, you combined them the right way, you would get a color image out of it at the end. So why do we use a black and white camera anyway? Anyone know? No guesses? <clears throat> I mean, there must be a reason to do it, right? Does it measure the brightness? It? it can measure much fainter things. It's much more sensitive. So using a black and white camera, it's much more sensitive than using a color camera. So that's why we go through the whole rigmarole with the filters. But it's also why you guys are going to need to select a filter when you guys are taking observations. Okay, so now you know why that's there. Okay. So, uh, one quick note on naming conventions. Just to be aware, we throw around a lot of terms in this class all the time. 
Uh, prompt is the set of six telescopes down in Chile that you're going to be using. You'll actually only be using four or five of them, but that's okay. But prompt are the telescopes. Skynet is a much larger network of telescopes. Prompt is only one piece of Skynet. There are actually a whole bunch of telescopes that are on Skynet. So here's Prompt. Prompt is controlled by Skynet, but Skynet controls all these other telescopes as well. Okay, so there are telescopes all over the world. But Prompt actually belongs to UNC. So you're going to be constraining your observations to the Prompt telescopes. Okay, so even if you see some of these other telescopes online, you probably want to stick with the Prompt ones. Your images will have the best chance of making it through the system by using those. Um, one quick note about uh, one of these telescopes, and that's this telescope called Dolomiti here. Uh, Dolomiti is actually located in the Italian Alps, and it's not just in the Italian Alps, because that's cool enough, right? Mm -hmm. It's in a ski resort in the Italian Alps. Now, we don't own that telescope, that's owned by the guy who owns the ski resort, actually, uh, but I keep hoping that one of these days his telescope will break and he'll need our help to fix it, <laughs> because that is a burden I am willing to take on. <laughs> I am willing to go there and help him out with that. But unfortunately, he's really good at what he does, so uh, it hasn't broken yet. But, uh, so here are where the telescopes are around the world right now that we control. So we have quite a few in the U.S., uh, a bunch in North Carolina, Colorado, California. Here is Prompt down at CTIO. Uh, here's Dolomiti over in Italy. Uh, eventually, we're going to be adding some telescopes in Thailand and some in Australia. They're not ready for the system yet, but they will be coming on eventually. Now the nice part about the ones in Australia is once those come online, and unfortunately this is a preview of things to come that won't help you at all, but just so you know, uh, once those are online, when it's daytime for us, it's nighttime for them. So we could get images back in real time. Okay. But anyway, that's uh, the Skynet system overall. So any questions about any of that stuff? All right, if not, we are now going to actually go through putting an observation into the Skynet system. And if you want to, you can follow along at home on your laptops, but don't feel like you have to. All right, I'm going to reconnect to the wireless network. All right, so here is the main Skynet webpage, skynet.unc.edu. Uh, hopefully by now all of you have Skynet accounts. If you don't have a Skynet account, see us before you leave tonight. We'll get your Skynet account set up for you, uh, and it'll be great. Uh, but you'll come here and you will log in, and there's a set of tabs across the top. Some of those are going to be grayed out for you because you don't have access to those functions. That's okay, don't worry about it. I have access to all of them because I work here, so you know, I can get to do all of this stuff. Uh, you're mainly going to be constrained to the observation manager most of the time, but before we go there, I want to point out a couple of other tools. Over on the left-hand side, there's this set of stuff labeled Tools and Info. And so one of them you can look at is the Prompt Webcam. So here is a live view from Prompt right now. This dome over here, this is Prompt 7 that just got built. Uh, there's not actually a telescope inside it yet. We're shipping it down right now. Uh, but here are the Prompt telescopes in the background here. Uh, and this camera can actually be zoomed in and moved around. Someone has clicked on it, as a matter of fact, to make it move. Uh, so if you want to, you can browse around the mountain and see the other things that are there. Um, if you want to see if it's nighttime at the observatory you want to use, we do have this handy dandy map. It's updated every time you refresh the page. So you can see right now, here's that terminator I was talking about, the, the line between day and night. So that line is moving across. It's not yet nighttime in Chile. It's not nighttime here. So uh, those mesh up pretty well. We're eventually going to have to move this gray box once the telescopes in Australia get on here, but uh, it's okay for now. All right, so let's say that we've come here and we actually want to put in an observation. So we'll click on the observation manager. And eventually it will catch up with me, I promise. All right, so here we are, we're at the observation manager. The first time you come to the observation manager, you're probably not going to have anything down here at the bottom because this is displaying all of your observations. Now I've been here a while, so I have a whole bunch of observations, but this will all be empty for you when you first show up and that's fine. Uh, so here's where you can fall into the first trap. Let's say that on your lab you're asked to observe Saturn. So you end up on this page and you say, oh, okay, well, I'll just type in Saturn right here. Well, that's actually your first mistake. Because this is not how you put in an observation here, this is how you search your observations. So after you've been around a while and you've got a couple of hundred observations, finding an observation again later is kind of a pain. So we put in a search box so you can go and find your observations. So searching for Saturn here is probably not going to be helpful if you don't have any observations. So what should I click on instead? Add How about this big button that says add observation? 
So if I go there, this is the beginning of our add observation, and I was actually playing around with it earlier, so I actually already have a Saturn observation in here. Uh, but when you come here normally, all of this will be empty. You won't have any coordinates or anything. So there are a couple of different ways you can put an observation onto the system to take, a, take an image. Uh, if you happen to know the coordinates of your object, you can just type them in right here. There are these two coordinates called right ascension and declination. And those two coordinates are just like latitude and longitude on the globe. The right ascension and declination refer to coordinates in the sky. But everything in the sky has an RA and a dex. So if you knew them, you could just type them in right here. But if you don't know them, you can look them up using this lookup box at the top. So let's say I didn't want to look at Saturn, let's say I wanted to look at Jupiter. So I'll type in Jupiter, hit look up. And it does a couple of things when you do that. The first thing that it does is it fills in an observation <coughs> name for you. It very generically just takes whatever you typed into this box. Now you can change this name if you want to. It won't change anything about the observation except what his name is. So if you want to be able to find that observation later, you may want to give that a more descriptive name like Jupiter Lab 1 or Jupiter Lab 2, you know, whatever it happens to be. It's something that you can find later on. Uh, it also puts in coordinates for you, which is great. Uh, but the other thing that it does is it generates a plot down at the bottom of the screen. <coughs> and so here is uh, an observability plot or an air mass plot. Uh, this is telling you whether you can observe this object or not. And it's extremely important that you actually look at this plot before you proceed. Okay? So we're actually displaying a whole bunch of observatories. That's what each of these colored lines on here are, or a bunch of different observatories around the world. Which of those observatories do we actually care about? CTIO. Right? That's where Prompt is located. So CTIO is the red line, and that's this red line right here. So now we just have to figure out how do we tell, given that red line, how do we tell if it's going to be observable tonight? So to figure that out, we have these two other lines, these two horizontal lines here. And this bottom horizontal line here that's in the middle of the plot, this horizontal line uh, is telling us about elevation of zero. So an elevation above the horizon of zero. So where is zero? Zero is the horizon, right? So an elevation of zero, it's zero degrees above the horizon, that's the horizon itself. So if it doesn't get above this line, it never gets above the horizon at all. But we're worried about a little bit more than that. There's this other black line that's a little bit higher than that, because if you actually look at something right on the horizon, it's really hard to see down there. So we want to try and constrain ourselves to not going all the way down to the horizon. We're going to about 20 degrees or so. This is what's actually the uh, air mass of three is our cutoff for that. So we want to make sure that our object gets above that line for it to be observable. So is Jupiter observable from CTIO tonight? Yeah. Yes, right, because we have this little section here where it's actually observable. Now each of these lines is drawn from sunset of the <laughs> observatory. So the left-hand side of the plot is always right now, and the line doesn't start until it's going to be dark at our observatory. So just by looking at this plot, we know, okay, well, it isn't yet sunset at CTIO, but when it does get to be sunset, Jupiter is up, but it's setting. So we'll have a little window at the very beginning of the night when we can actually observe Jupiter, but Jupiter is absolutely observable. Okay, so let's take a look at one or two other <coughs> objects real quick. Let's take a look at Mercury. There's Mercury, another planet. Here's the air mass plot for Mercury. Is Mercury observable from CTIO tonight? <coughs> absolutely not. So, should you put in an observation for Mercury? No. Absolutely not. You may have noticed there was a little subliminal message going on in the background of my slides that said if it's not visible, you're not responsible for observing it. So, if it's not visible, don't even bother putting in the job. With that being said, I'm sure someone in this class is going to put in an observation of Mercury even though it will not be visible all semester. These air mass plots do change over time because what objects are up in the sky does change from night to night. But they change very, very slowly. They change on scales of months, not of days. So if it's not observable tonight, it's not observable tomorrow. It's probably not observable the day after that either. So if it's not observable, don't worry about it. Don't even put the job in. Okay? So let's look at one more, and then we'll actually go on with the rest of this. Saturn. All right. So here's Saturn's air mass plot. Is Saturn observable from Chile tonight? Yes. Absolutely. Is it visible at the very beginning of the night? No, it's still below the horizon at the beginning of the night. 
but it does rise as the night goes on, and by sunrise, it's really high in the sky. So it will be observable at CTIO. So I could observe Saturn tonight. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and put in this observation. <coughs> so let's go back up to the top of the page and talk about the other things you need to fill in. So we've got coordinates. We got those by looking it up. We've got a name. We can give it a different name if we want to. That's fine. Uh, there are only a couple of other things that you need to worry about here, and most of you don't need to change. So basically, all of this stuff, don't worry about changing. So you've got a priority level. You guys, I think, have priority level five. Just leave it at five. Don't worry about the max air mass or the sun elevation unless the lab instructs you otherwise. Don't worry about what group you're using because you only have the one group that you're in. And don't even think about touching this box until much later in the semester. It's very confusing. Don't worry about it. But you do need to select a filter before we go on. So here's a whole list of filters over here. Each lab will tell you what you need to observe, what filter you need to observe it in. So here's where you choose your filter. In this case, I'm actually going to choose open for my filter. So I'll choose open and I'll hit next. All right, so once again, it gives me an air mass plot to make sure that I haven't done something crazy. But it's also now went and checked the system to figure out what telescopes are connected to Skynet where this object will be visible someday, maybe not today, but it will definitely be visible at some point, and it has that filter I just selected. It won't show any telescopes that don't meet those two criteria. So here's a whole list of telescopes on here. The telescopes that I want you to use, though, are the prompt telescopes. Don't choose ARO, don't choose Moorhead, don't choose any of those. The only telescopes I want you to use are the prompt telescopes. With that in mind, prompts 1, 3, 4, and 5 can all see it. Which one should I select? All of them. All of them. Absolutely correct. You want to select all of the prompt telescopes. The only <coughs> prompt telescope that you don't want to select if you can avoid it is prompt 2. Now, thankfully, prompt 2 doesn't actually have the open filter, so that's okay for this one. But try and avoid prompt 2 if you can. Prompt 2 is only online about half of the month. It's used by another group the other half of the month. So you could put an observation in on just prompt 2 and you're not going to get it for, you know, three and a half weeks, and that's probably not really good for you. So go ahead and choose prompts one, three, four, and five whenever possible, and I will hit next. And now Skynet has done another check in the background without you knowing about it, and it said, whoa, whoa, easy there, killer. You're taking a picture of something that is really, really bright. And that's why it has all this red text here. It's telling me that that field has something overwhelmingly bright in it, and that's dangerous. We want to make sure that you don't take too long of an exposure. So it's actually going to limit my exposure length. So here, it's limited it to a tenth of a second. That's all the longer it's going to let me observe this object. So that's fine. That's OK. At least I'm aware of it. So now, I need to tell it just two more things. I need to tell it how many pictures I want, in this case, one, and how long I want that picture to be. And I'm just going to say, like, uh, 0.05 seconds. I'm just picking a number here. Your lab will actually tell you what these numbers ought to be. OK? So now I hit next. And Skynet gives me one last chance to make sure I have not done something overwhelmingly stupid, like put in 10,000 exposures on a telescope, because that would just be crazy. So it's telling me that I have one exposure in the open filter, and then it's going to go on all four of these telescopes. And whichever one is able to do it first, will do it. Okay? So this all looks good, so I will press confirm. And lo and behold, I have a new observation that has appeared in my table. Now notice that this observation is currently listed as being active and it's green. So it's telling me that the observation is in the system, but it's not yet taken. So I could go and click on it, but I'll find that there's nothing there, right? So it's telling me, oh, there's one exposure. The exposure is ready, but it hasn't actually been taken. So I'm going to go back. And let's go look for a different set of observations. Now I'm actually going to use this search box. Let's look for a different Saturn observation that I took at some point in the past. So here's a Saturn observation that I did take. And so this was taken a while back, but that's okay. We're just going to use it for illustration purposes. So once your observation has come back and you click on it, you'll find that there are some links that you can look at here. So I can download it in the FITS format, which is a special format that we use for astronomical images. You probably <laughs> won't ever need to download the FITS format. We're going to use those, we're going to process those using another piece of software you'll find out about next week. But you may want to go and just take a glance at your image. So there's this JPEG link. So I'm going to click on my JPEG of Saturn, and it's going to be great. Bam! Whoa. Best picture of Saturn ever. I know you're all overwhelmed. Okay, it actually kind of looks like an egg, but that's okay. So here's Saturn. It's in the very center of the image. If you squint and tilt your head kind of to the side window, well, 
Maybe that's a planet with a ring around it, I guess. But then there are these two dots. What are those two dots? Well, let me tell you what's going on here. An astronomical CCD is actually able to capture, capture a much broader range of intensities than I could display with this projector. So right now, it's made a choice. It's focusing on just the faint things, not the bright things. So the bright things look all washed out. Saturn looks completely washed out, but the faint things, these dots, which are moons of Saturn, I can see the moons. Okay, so it defaults to trying to find faint things, because most of the time we're trying to observe faint things. But that information is still there, it just can't display it. So there's this second link here because it knows that this is a planet. Because when I put it into the system, I searched for Saturn, and the system knows that Saturn is a planet. So it's generated another JPEG for me called the JPEG Planet. And if I click on that, well, that looks a lot more like what we expect Saturn to look like, right? This is the exact same image as we were just looking at. All we've done is changed the scaling. So now I'm looking at the bright stuff and ignoring the faint stuff. So in fact, the moons, the moons are gone. I can't even see those anymore. But it's the exact same image as I was just using. Okay? So just be aware that the system does that. All right? We are now going to break up into two groups. And one group is going to come with me upstairs. The other group is going to stay down here and see a couple of things. And then we're going to switch. So everybody will get their chance. 